you know, over these years <coughs> that we've been together, it's very often been said that we have to be divine scientists, we have to be divine physicists, and we have to be divine alchemists. And we know science, that we, it's experiential and experimental. And we know in the physical sense and the spiritual sense, we've explored that. So we are divine scientists. And divine physicists, we know that's embracing the microcosm and the macrocosm and that we've had to do in our spiritual journey. And the divine alchemy also, we know the chemistry of love and light. We know how it works. We've been transmitters and seen the changes that take place in people's <coughs> lives from what has emanated from us. So we've embraced these three. But it's now said that we also have to be divine mystics. Now, we could say that you can say that's a divine and that's a mystic. And we know that they're synonymous. They're the same, a divine and a mystic. But just to coin a phrase and to keep it going. But how do we know that we're divine mystics? That's what we're going to explore over the coming days. How do we know? You know, Mula Nasruddin went to a psychiatrist. You know, he put up those white boards that had the ink blobs on them. And he put them up in front of Mula Nasruddin's face. And he said, what's this, Mula? Mula said, oh, that's an elephant. In the next one, oh, that's a tiger. Oh, that's a monkey. Oh, that's a s snake. And so it went on until all the boards were down. And after the session was over, the psychiatrist said to the Mola Nasruddin, Mola, I do believe you've got a fixation with animals. <laughs> Mola said, what do you mean? You're the one with the menagerie. <laughs> King Solomon was out hunting with a troop of his soldiers and they were all thirsty and they came upon a stream. So it so happened that King Solomon had some salted fish in his bag and he took out the salted fish and he washed it in the stream and after he ate it, it was so succulent. And then he drank of the waters, and the water was so sweet. He said, oh, this water must emanate from the Garden of Eden. Let's follow the stream and see where it takes us. So King Solomon and his troop followed the stream until suddenly they came upon an angel with a flaming sword in his hand, standing in front of a gate. And King Solomon said, allow me to enter, even though all his troop ran away because the angel with the blazing sword was so frightening to them. <clears throat> but the angel said, only the righteous can enter here. But King Solomon, being King Solomon, he demanded of the angel. He said, I am a great king. If you won't let me enter in here, then give me a gift. So the angel gave him an eye. And when King Solomon took the eye, he found that it was very heavy. So he weighed it against all his gold and all his silver. And still the eye weighed more. So he asked the angel, how can this be? And the angel said, the eye of mankind 
is never satisfied. And King Solomon asked, well, tell me the reason why. And the angel said to King Solomon, take some dust and place it over the eye. And this King Solomon did. And immediately the eye took on its natural and normal weight. What does it mean to become a divine mystic? What are the attributes of a mystic? From our experiences, being divine scientists, divine physicists, and divine alchemists, we've learned when we meet someone, we can recognize when they're speaking the truth, when they're speaking with their mind or their heart. We've learned all of these things. We know these things. We experience these things as part of our daily life now. We can't be fooled. When somebody says, I'm fine, yes, I, you know, everything's good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> isn't it? And at a, a level of chemistry, of divine alchemy, we feel for them. At a divine physicist level, we know the workings of the being in relationship to that, whether there's an emanation from us to give sukha or comfort or whatever it is. Transmission. We know all of that. But what is the attribute of a divine mystic? We'll test it. What's the meaning of this story for you? What? Not the symbolism. We could go there. No. Now we have to be the divine mystic. What is a divine mystic? Test it. What's the meaning of this story? What does it mean to be given an eye and to place dust over it? What does it mean to say <coughs> the eye of mankind is never satisfied and to put dust over it and it to take its natural weight? What's the <coughs> deep meaning of this story? What's your understanding of this story? Is it um, the angel's eyes it is pure and sees the truth so truth has a way as look as um, as long as someone can't really let it go through it's very heavy uh -huh. so there's an alchemy to happen uh -huh. but as long as this didn't happen for someone that doesn't have the, the, the openness Mm -hmm. the, the, the emptiness, the stillness, this is very heavy. And putting dust is like making it blind uh -huh. or half uh -huh. blind. Uh -huh. So it takes its normal way. Okay. I've got another take on it. Yes. <laughs> it's probably totally off track. Not at all. But if you look at the eye as the ego, the yes. eye, you know, the eye um, if you have it clear and shiny, life is very difficult, very heavy. Yes. If you subdue the ego, put dust over it, cover it up, life becomes light and easy. <laughs> All right. All right. Yes. Um, how about the truth is in the eye of the beholder? Yes. So um, if the eye is hungry, if it can't see what's out there, it can't actually decide to want it. So All right. Yeah, um, yeah. So therefore, it, it then as without, so within, 
so therefore it's not heavy anymore because it's not trying to attain everything. All right, all right. Who's right? All of us. So over the coming days, we're going to explore this some How do we come to acknowledge where and know that we're not just divine scientists, divine physicists, divine alchemists, we're divine mystics.